Hello, I'm Erica Green. I am a neurologist and a neuromuscular specialist at Houston Methodist in the Medical Center. I am the division head for neuromuscular medicine and clinical research and trials in neuromuscular diseases, as well as the vice chair of education for the residency program and fellowship training programs. Today, I'm going to talk about advances in the treatment of myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is one of the most well-known autoimmune diseases in neurology. Uh, it is an immune-directed attack specifically at uh, proteins of the neuromuscular junction, uh, the acetylcholine receptor, and or other proteins related to nerve muscle transmission. This electron micrograph picture here really highlights the normal structure on high-powered magnified uh, imaging of the nerve terminal here and then here you have the muscle membrane, which is normally undulating. And this black spotted area over the muscle is staining specific for the acetylcholine receptors, which are clustered at the tops of the muscle membranes. This is uh, based on labeling with alpha bunguratoxin, which is a targeted toxin for the acetylcholine receptor. To the right is a picture of a neuromuscular junction of a patient with myasthenia gravis. And so this reflects the destruction of the immune targeted attack towards, for the most part, in most patients, the acetylcholine receptor. And you see that there is lack of this black staining or very few areas with this black staining, as well as the cytoarchitecture of the muscle membrane is totally disrupted. And so uh, this picture, I think, speaks a thousand words in terms of on a microscopic level, the degree of immune inflammatory mediated destruction of the nerve muscle junction. So much has been published, written, uh, described about patients with myasthenia gravis, even going back to the early 1900s. Um, and so prior to that, over 100 years ago, before anyone really knew what was causing it and how to treat it, the mortality rate was nearly 100%. It wasn't until the early 1900s when a group of surgeons, uh, both at John Hopkins and the um, Royal College of London, uh, started doing thymectomies in patients who either had uh, significant weakness, difficulty swallowing, and were found to have enlarged thymuses. This is a primary immune organ which sits right behind this, uh, the sternum. And they also did this type of surgery in patients who were in thyroid crisis who also had hyperthyroidism. And they found that in patients for which they took the thymus out, there was a marked improvement in their function uh, and in their strength. Um, it was even better in those patients who also had hyperthyroidism, which is not uncommon in myasthenia yeah, patients to have thyroid disease. And when they took out a portion of the thyroid, the patients did even better. Uh, it wasn't until the 1960s, however, where we started to realize that there was something circulating in the plasma of these patients that was mediating the pathology and the symptom onset and progression of the disease. And um, sort of by serendipity noted that patients who were undergoing dialysis for other reasons or lymphatic draining, who also had this syndrome of fatigable weakness were also getting better. But it wasn't until the Korean War in which advent of ICU care units really emerged on the scene, ventilatory support became the standard of care as a life-saving measure, that we started to see marked improvement in the survival of these patients. Uh, and actually, not until the late 70s and 80s uh, did we begin to identify the target that the immune system was actually targeting the acetylcholine receptor uh, on skeletal muscle and then therapies started to emerge that really dealt with the immune-mediated pathology or pathophysiology of this disease. Currently now there are over 12 commonly used treatments for myasthenia gravis, and this is just a simple illustration uh, to show uh, how many therapies or categories of therapies that we use from pyridostigmine, which is really a symptomatic therapy. It, uh, it causes um, the acetylcholine, which is the uh, the neurotransmitter, which is the ligand for the acetylcholine receptor on muscle, very important for neuromuscular transition, to last longer. So it sort of overcompensates, it stimulates the muscle longer. The rest of the drugs that you see on this, on this table are immune modulating. Of course, prednisone remains a very commonly used drug, very effective, 
We also have uh, chemotherapy drugs, steroid sparing drugs, such as azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetel. Uh, in the past, we've used cytoxin. And even for patients who have difficult to manage disease, we've actually used tacrolimus and cyclosporin. Some of these other medicines here, rituximab, monoclonal antibodies directed against B cells, CD19, CD20 cells, and even some of the newer drugs that I will talk about today are therapies that are more uh, targeted towards uh, specific proteins, specific cell populations versus the earlier medicines or the medicines we've used standardly uh, do not have that specific targeted effect. And then I'm going to end my talk by talking about our newly FDA approved drugs and some of the advances and the uh, future advances uh, with clinical trials that are ongoing. Of course, we have our rescue therapy with plasma exchange and IVIG, which is classically used for that patient who is in a crisis of neuromuscular uh, junction failure, where breathing, swallowing, uh, clearing secretions is impaired because the skeletal muscle is so weakened and fatigued. And I'll also talk about the role of thymectomy. So over you know decades and over a century, we have seen just an evolution of emerging therapies from thymectomy, as I mentioned earlier in the early 1900s, to a quadre of different immune modulating therapies and interventions, which has really improved the outcome for, for our patients and made myasthenia gravis a very manageable disease. And so this just demonstrates that evolution of therapy and the impact upon survival uh, over time. So here you have uh, the death rate, which was nearly 100% in the early 1900s. And as we've uh, developed therapies and interventions, that death rate has dropped down to what we now see is at about 2 to 3%, 6 to 8% in other studies. And then you see this increase in survival or the number of cases that are prevalent. Uh, currently. So I said this is an autoimmune disease, and it is. Uh, when you give uh, antibodies to animal models, when you give acetylcholine receptor protein, which has been uh, targeted for an immune attack in animal models, they develop something similar to myasthenia gravis. And we can actually measure those antibodies in patients, the majority of patients, with myasthenia gravis. So it does fit the criteria for primary autoimmune disease. Um, but often, many of us really don't understand the complexity of the immune system and why patients develop an autoimmune disease such as myasthenia gravis. And so um, because the immune system is so complex, I'll quote Albert Einstein, um, who basically said that um, if that to be able to explain something, it's important to explain it in a way that even your grandmother can understand. Uh, in so many words, I'm paraphrasing. But so I've always used the analogy of the military to explain the immune system. So the immune system is made up of many different cell types, uh, proteins, signaling proteins, and chemokines that ensures that we are guarded against whatever offending agent, whether it's virus, bacteria, fungus, or cancer. So it's equivalent to the military system in that there's the Army, there's the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy, different branches of the immune system, which all are there to protect the, the land, the country, both foreign and domestic uh, enemies. And likewise, the immune system is structured similarly in that there are different cell types which have all the same goal of protecting the host from internal and external uh, foreign agents or enemies. Uh, but they all do it with a different role and a different mechanism and a different identity, but they all work together. And so this is a busy slide, but I put it here to sort of talk about very quickly how our immune system develops. The immune system is developing early in life, and the primary immune uh, organs for that basically is the bone marrow where you have stem cells. Stem cells can turn into any cell in the human body, and so there is a, a certain population which can begin to differentiate into two major cell types of the immune system, the T and the B cell. These early T and B cells can then move into primary or generating lymphoid organs such as the thymus, which again is, the, is an immune organ underneath the sternum, or into the bone marrow or into other locations, and can then further differentiate from an immature B cell 
into more mature B cells, which then circulate in the blood or reside in secondary lymphoid organs, such as your lymph nodes and your spleen. The T cell, once it matures in the thymus, is then released to circulate, to sort of act as a watchman on the wall for any invading foreigners, infectious agents, cancer, to then direct and initiate an immune attack. This is a cute little cartoon. And so uh, I like to say that the thymus uh, being a primary uh, lymphoid organ is like the boot camp. These stem cells uh, exit and they either go into the bone marrow or the thymus to go through a boot camp where they are matured and they are trained to determine and to attack only foreign objects, agents, antigens, infections, and not attack the host. The problem is in myasthenia gravis, there's enough evidence to support that this training, this boot camp of our immune cells in the thymus is abnormal. That instead of graduating from boot camp as mature T cells with the ability to attack only what's foreign, there's a release of T cells that are poorly trained that target proteins that are inherent or part of the host, such as the acetylcholine receptor on skeletal muscle. And so this is just a, another diagram saying the same thing. And so you have the basic training of these T cells, which can turn into helper cells, which uh, can modulate and start the immune system, cytotoxic cells, which really are the serial, the sort of uh, um, Navy seals, and then the T regulatory cells, which can downregulate. And they, for whatever reason, are targeting proteins specific for muscle function, the acetylcholine receptor, there are other proteins I'll mention, the musk and the LRP4 proteins, all of which are normal or necessary for normal neuromuscular junction transmission. And so this is a cartoon of a normal nerve and muscle uh, junction. You have the nerve terminal with acetylcholine neurotransmitter in vesicles. And when there's an electron or a depolarization, this acetylcholine is released between the muscle and the nerve and these are the acetylcholine receptors for which the chemical binds and activates muscle contraction. There are other proteins that are very important for this acetylcholine receptor to be at the top of the muscles, and this is the musk. And we now know that many patients who don't have antibodies to acetylcholine receptor uh, have antibodies to musk and also have a myasthenia gravis presentation. Just to remind you, this is the structure microscopically of how they all interact. You have musk. You have LRP4, which makes a complex, which is um, interacted by agrin, which comes from the nerve. And this complex is very important for the clustering of the acetylcholine receptors at the top of the muscles and their maintenance and viability. Normal neuromuscular trans, uh, junction and an abnormal neuromuscular junction mediated by destruction of antibodies and an immune attack against either acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle, and for a portion of patients, the musk receptor, which is also important for neuromuscular junction transmission. Just to remind you of the therapies before we transition into some newly FDA approved therapies and some active current trials. Um, before I do that, however, I just wanna remind you that there is one more therapy on that list, and I'll go back to that, and that is the role of the thymus. So I've already highlighted how the thymus is the area where T cells are trained. It's the boot camp site. And so obviously if the thymus is not training those T cells properly, there's something probably wrong going on in the thymus. And at a microscopic histopathologic level, we see that in many patients, over 80% of patients who have antibodies against acetylcholine receptor, we see this follicular um, sort of expansion of the thymus in patients where the thymus has been taken out. And you see this follicular expansion uh, of cells and uh, within the thymus uh, compared to other parts of the thymus. And this is a patient who has um, uh, a thymic hyperplasia. It's enlarged and usually in adults, there shouldn't be anything there. But in 85% of patients, we find that it's expanded and active. And in a smaller percentage of patients, 15%, we actually often will see a benign or even a malignant thymoma, usually in older males. 
And so there were many studies looking at the benefit of thymectomy in these patients, but it wasn't until a landmark study, which took about a decade to complete. It was an international study, placebo controlled or sham controlled, where patients were randomized to have a thymectomy on prednisone or just receive prednisone alone. And uh, these were patients where they measured um, their motor score, uh, the amount of prednisone they needed over time, the amount of hospitalizations or rescue therapy. And so this took many, many years, but it was a landmark and class one study. And what it showed was that patients who had the thymectomy in terms of their scores, their mean scores, did better than the patients who were just on prednisone alone. The disability was less in thymectomy and the amount of prednisone that they needed over time was less if they had the thymectomy on prednisone versus just the prednisone alone. When they followed these patients over a year, three years, and now we have data even greater than three years to show that the patients who had the thymectomy over time had less hospitalizations, required less medicine, and overall had better ability or functional scores. So the thymus gland is really indicated in those patients who have acetylcholine receptor positive myasthenia gravis and often younger patients under the age of 40 who have difficulty uh, managing their disease with standard therapy. And some doctors actually do it at early in the disease um, just to improve long-term clinical course. So let's get into some of the novel and emerging therapies. This is a busy slide, but it really highlights again the immune system. Here's that T cell, which uh, should be mature, and it has an antigen cell that presents the foreign protein, and it activates and a, a whole cascade of events, which leads to targeted attack. In the case of myasthenia gravis, this T cell uh, can differentiate into T, different types of T cell lineage, which can then interact with the B cell and activate the B cell to turn into a plasma cell, which then releases antibodies, which are specific in the case of myasthenia gravis to the acetylcholine receptor, or for musk, the musk receptor. And this mechanism often attracts a protein called complement, which attaches to the muscle and destroys it. These antibodies, also circulate. We now know that they continue to circulate by going into endothelial cells, getting cleaned up, and being released back into the system to continue the attack. And I think earlier, with our earlier treatments, we weren't targeting that specific mechanism, and patients would often need treatments to continually target these antibodies, such as potentially IVIG and plasmapheresis, but they would need to come back every three to four or five weeks probably because these antibodies kept recycling into the system. And so by knowing the immune mechanisms, it's allowed us to identify therapies and test them that are more specific for specific cells, activation signals, and proteins, and even the process of recycling uh, to really do precise targeted therapy with less side effects and which are equally if not more effective than some of the traditional therapies. And this uh, slide really highlights some of the drugs that I'll talk about, some of which are being studied that are targeting and blocking this recycling of antibodies, as well as therapies that are upcoming to, that are targeting genetically engineered T cells, which will not activate the B cells. And then of course we have therapies that block the B cells and we have therapies that, direct, that are directed against complement. And so these are some of the clinical trials um, that are targeted towards stopping the recycling of those immunoglobulins. Uh, Fgartigamod is number five, which has been recently FDA approved, as well as uh, drugs that have been studied that are directed at blocking the complement, which deposits at the muscle and uh, causes uh, destruction. So complement is a normal part of our immune system. It's a cascade of different proteins, which all activate in a series um, to basically result in and, and modulate the immune attack. Uh, they're involved in a number of different pathways. And in the case of myasthenia, it's the terminal portion of the complement cascade, um, C5, 6, 8, and 9, which then come together on cells, on tissues, um, 
to create a pore or what we call a membrane attack complex, which basically lyses or uh, opens up and destroys the cell membrane. In the case of myasthenia, the muscle membrane. And so this is just a diagram showing the same thing, how the protein parts come together to create this pore. And this is an uh, electron micrograph of a cell membrane showing these holes, which have been punched through by this MAC complex. And so the study and the drug I'll talk about is ecoluzumab. Uh, it was the Regain study. The brand name is Solaris. It is FDA approved in the past few years. And it was a 26-week study looking at the changes in the activities of daily living of myasthenia patients. This study was interesting because it looked not at a, a primary measure of what a physician measures, but what the patient reports, one of the first studies to do so. And it recruited patients who were not early in their disease, but patients who had had the disease for many years, had antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor, but were already taking two to three immune suppressive therapies or modulating uh, um, treatments. So these are patients who were doing okay, but were still symptomatic, possibly still going into the hospital despite taking two or three medicines. And so this is the data, 90% were taking at least two of the therapies I've mentioned in an earlier slide. Half of them had been hospitalized in the past year. 20% required ventilatory support and yet were still symptomatic based on a tool that we use to measure activities of daily living called the MGADL. And so this is the result of the study. And so you see in the red, this is the placebo and this is the patients who were randomized or uh, to get the drug. And you see immediately within the first four weeks, there's an improvement with a, um, in the MGADL score compared to the placebo patient. At the end of the 26 weeks, all patients were allowed to get the drug. This is the open label. And you see that those who were on placebo who got the drug showed the same steep improvement. And this, these patients are still being monitored and reported on in the MG registry for which our site is a report, is a site. They also found that there were a number of patients who received the drug who acquired the state or the stage of minimal manifestations of disease, which is really where no one else can tell they have myasthenia, only they can feel maybe a little bit, maybe a heavy lid, but no one else can tell. And in the placebo arm, only 14% uh, reached this level compared to 52% in the drug arm. Uh, and then once they went into the open label study, this increased to 60% when you added the placebo on the drug. And of course, the exacerbations, the hospitalizations dropped significantly in the treatment arm, uh, the subjects in the treatment arm of the study. So Ultimaris is a similar drug to Solaris. It's made by the same company. It has been modified. Uh, um, so that its half-life is much longer. It's also a complement inhibitor. I won't talk long about it. They basically looked at it um, at various doses and they found that it was equally effective for myasthenia gravis, but it allowed patients to be dosed every eight weeks, whereas Solaris requires IV dosing every other week. So this was FDA approved last year and we are now using that and sometimes switching our patients from the every other week formulation to the every eight week infusion formulation. The side effects for both of these drugs are similar and they're really, what we see is about 10% have maybe some muscle aches. There may be a greater risk of upper respiratory tract infections, um, but no major infections uh, related to this drug. It is important for me to tell you that complement is very important for uh, combating and dealing with certain bacterial infections, such as Neisseria meningitis and streptococcal pneumonia. These are encapsulated bacterial pathogens for which complement is very effective at battling or clearing. And so when you give patients a complement inhibitor, they're at greater risk for these very serious infections. So in order for patients to receive these two therapies, they must be vaccinated for Neisseria meningitis, both the four standard or common serotypes, but even serotype type B, which is rare, but much more fatal or serious infection. Uh, there is another complement inhibitor. I won't talk long. This was a phase two study, and it looked at the activities of daily living. It also looked at the physician's QMG score, which is the physician's measure of their strength. And similar to the other study, you see that, again, the treatment arm improved significantly 
uh, in terms of their strength as well as their activities of daily living uh, here. And then the open label allowed the placebo to get to drug and you see this similar drop. This is a little less impressive probably here because the sample size is smaller than the other study. And this has not been FDA approved uh, in terms of its uh, stage of drug development. Uh, and uh, also in terms of minimal uh, manifestation of disease, uh, they looked at two doses plus placebo, and there was a dose response effect that more patients on higher doses had a greater chance of reaching that stage of minimal manifestations of disease. So now I'm gonna to switch to another mechanism, and this is that mechanism that I spoke to you about, about the recycling of immunoglobulins. So uh, normally, as I said, immunoglobulins uh, are circulating in our system, and the FC receptor, or the FC portion of our immunoglobulins, docks on an FC receptor um, docked on endothelial cells, and basically uh, gets uh, taken in via lysosome and is bound very tight because of the pH, and basically gets recycled out into your plasma. Very few get degraded. So they uh, developed, the drug companies, um, developed a drug called Fgartigamod, which actually competitively binds to these FCRN receptors, these neonatal FC receptors, so that the immunoglobulin cannot bind and therefore gets delegated to be destroyed in a lysosomal endosomal pathway. And so you get less release or less recycling of, of IgGG. And so this study, or the ADAPT study, looked at uh, this drug versus placebo in a one-to-one -one study in 167 uh, acetylcholine receptor positive myasthenia gravis patients. It's dosed, basically four doses, four weekly IV infusions. Um, and then based on phase two study, they, de they determined that it was best for patients or their physicians to decide when the next cycle of these infusions would occur uh, because it varies per patient. Uh, and so the sort of uh, criteria for recycling would be if they've gone uh, greater than five weeks since the last initiation, if their uh, functional score of activities of daily living uh, had gone up to over five points, or if they haven't improved at all, if they haven't at least improved by two points, this would be the indication to receive another uh, cycle of infusions. And about a quarter of patients were those who were not uh, acetylcholine receptor positive. Some were musk positive as well, which is important for that patient population. And so what we know is that the patients, a vast majority of patients responded with improvement of their MGA-DL score by 67.7% compared to 29% in the placebo group. And then when they looked at the physician measure of their motor strength and function, there was also even a greater difference in the treatment arm. And so if we go back to that minimal symptom expression where only the patient can feel it and no one else can really detect it, you saw that a vast majority of patients receiving Fgartigamod uh, achieve this state. And so just very quickly, what they found was that there were a percentage of patients who didn't respond with the first set of infusions. But when they went to the second set of infusions, five weeks later at least, they found that an additional almost 40%, about 36% achieved significant benefit from the second infusion, which tells us as practitioners that if we start our patients on these drugs, it may be necessary for a percentage of us to wait to the second uh, round of infusions before we determine if it's beneficial or not. And so because this mechanism uh, of the drug is to deplete the pool of immunoglobulin circulating in the plasma, and it's not just specific for IgG1, it's specific for IgG1, 2, 3, and 4, you see here that for the acetylcholine receptor antibody, which is in the dark blue, I believe, and the IgG uh, amount, which is in the dark green, that the drug drops both of these antibodies significantly, and it's around the five week where we see an increase. And so that's why they chose the five week as the typical cutoff that a patient can use, although some patients went longer and some patients could go shorter. So this is another FCRN receptor modulator, Nipocalamab.
Uh, but this is a phase two study, which is still ongoing. And they're looking at several doses of this drug. And, and some of the uh, phase two study data that's been released shows also a significant improvement that seems to be either dose dependent or frequency dependent uh, between the first set of infusions versus the second set of infusions. And so we're looking forward to the results of ongoing studies and possibly we'll have another drug FDA approved in the next couple of years as they complete a phase three study. So I'm gonna conclude my talk by sort of talking about what else is on the horizon. Uh, there is a phase two trial uh, which has started and is now recruiting and recruiting sites looking at genetically engineered CAR T cells. Now CAR T cell therapy has its roots in oncology where uh, T cell receptors are attached to genetically engineered chimera uh, antigen receptors. And so it's genetically engineered so that the T cell receptor is specific against a specific target. In cancer, it's against cancer. But in myasthenia, this trial is looking at engineered CAR T cells that are specifically directed against those B cell plasma cells, which actually develop the antibodies. And there's also some work looking at subcutaneous immunoglobulin for mild to moderate exacerbations of myasthenia gravis. So in conclusion, there have been many recent advances, including targeted immune therapy that has changed the clinical course for many of our patients who before had to sort of be at peace with living a less than normal life. And so it's given some of our patients the ability to, to return back to things and activities of living that they had otherwise given up on. I think future advances will include identifying novel therapies for use in crisis, as well as we will be challenged with all of these emerging therapies with the cost of these drugs and the coverage for them. Currently, we're dealing with that in our clinical practice, but so far for the majority of patients, they've been able to access these therapies. I think the role of flexible dosing is gonna be very important as we can see from the fgar tigamod data where patients can individualize the frequency of their dosing, maybe even in the future, the dose of their dose of their drug. Um, and so uh, with that, I will conclude uh, my talk. I thank you for your time and thank you very much.